I showed him the picture. I said, this is my wife versus her car up there. Is, is that, is that tell me that's not her under, under that tar? That she has been stabbed repeatedly about her face and throat. It's apparent that she has been murdered. When a person is murdered in a way like this, it looks so personal, so filled with hate. You don't need to stab someone 40 times to kill them. So if you're stabbing someone 40 times, you are enraged, you are angry. On January 30th, 2008, in the city of Raleigh, North Carolina, a man driving to work on Interstate 540 came across a terrifying thing. When he moved closer to see what it was, he discovered it wasn't a thing at all. It was a woman, and she had been brutally slain in a crime that seemed quite personal. During the course of the investigation into this chilling murder, authorities would uncover a tale of lies, betrayal, and a fatal obsession. We also learned new details today about a possible motive in the murder of a college student, Latrice Curtis. Police found her to death on the side of I-540 in Raleigh in January. On January 29, 2008, Latrice Curtis was headed over to her boyfriend's house. Stephen Randolph was a college basketball player who charmed Latrice from the moment they met. He was popular, charming, and undeniably attractive, and before she knew it, she was swept into his allure and they began a relationship. On that day, Latrice went over to Stephen's house as she had done many times before. She pulled over, got in, and they began their intimate moment together. When they were done, Latrice put on her clothes and got in her car. As she drove home, she thought about her relationship with Stephen. She had started having feelings for him and wanted to take their relationship to the next level, but she wasn't sure he felt the same way about her. They had been seeing each other for some time now, and she was ready. She picked up her phone to dial Stephen's number and told him she wanted to take their relationship to the next level. Stephen, surprised by her proposal, suggested they talk about it some other time. Latrice agreed and hung up. She didn't exactly get the response she wanted, but they would talk about it the next time they saw each other. As she got on the interstate, Latrice noticed she was being followed and immediately tensed up. The car eventually came around to her side and she relaxed. It was someone she knew. She pulled over to speak to the person. She never saw the knife coming. The next day at around 7 a.m. in Raleigh, North Carolina, a man on his way to work drove past something that he thought looked rather odd against the backdrop of the signboard. He pulled over close to it and backed up to get a better look. And just under the green college sign was the body of a young woman, her arms and legs splayed out and completely covered in gore. It was immediately obvious that this woman was dead. The man called 911 to report the horror he had just witnessed. Officers came came to the scene, and just by the gruesome nature of the murder, they knew it had to be a crime of passion. When a person is murdered in a way like this, it looks so personal, so filled with hate. She didn't have any ID on her, so they couldn't immediately identify her. But as they looked around for clues, they found an abandoned white car, half a mile from where the body was found. If the car was abandoned this close to the body, there was a strong possibility it belonged to the victim. As they approached the vehicle, they could see a man leaning into it from the driver's side of the door. When the man looked up and noticed uniform officers heading his way, he quickly got out and started heading toward them. He told the officers that the car was similar to that of someone he knew, someone dear to him. The man identified himself as Darren Curtis, and the car, he said, seemed to be that of his wife, Latrice Curtis. Latrice Curtis was born on May 28, 1986 in Raleigh, North Carolina to Sherman Jones and Cynthia Wheeler. The Jones previously had three boys, and Latrice was a welcome surprise. Everything changed the moment Latrice was born. Sherman Jones knew the first time his baby girl opened her eyes and looked at him that he would love her until his dying breath. But what he didn't know was that she would be his best friend. Latrice was a daddy's girl. Her dad was her hero, and she followed him everywhere from the moment she could crawl. She loved her father and wanted to do everything he did, including playing his favorite sport, basketball. Latrez was so close to her father that her brothers tagged her, daddy's little boy, in a dress. Being the only girl, she got special attention. She had to get away with things that the boys never got away with. Her father loved and soaked up all of the attention Latrice paid him, because as hard as it was for him to admit, he knew a day would come when Latrice would grow up, and all of the attention would stop. That day came sooner than Sherman would have liked. When Latrice hit her teens, she stopped following her father around so much, and as much as it broke Sherman's heart, he had no choice but to accept it. Latrice was becoming her own person. She was finding her own hobbies and figuring out how to fit in with girls her age. Latrice was always a people person. She could just walk up to you and just start a conversation. She was 
just adorable. Latrice grew up to be a smart and beautiful girl, so she was popular. She could hold her own in any conversation and wasn't scared of anyone after all. She had grown up with three brothers, but with Latrice's newfound popularity came boys. And her father did not like that one bit. But Latrice had been raised right. Her father had taught her everything he knew, and that included being careful around boys. So as much as Sherman didn't like the attention she was getting from boys, he trusted her to take care of herself. And he was right. Latrice always put school first before boys, and that got her into a a good local college in Raleigh where she would study accounting. When the day came that Sherman had to drop off his daughter at college, his heart was broken. He had never been away from Latrez for any length of time, and tears welled up in his eyes as he watched his daughter drag her luggage into her dorm. Latrice fit perfectly into college. She made many friends quickly, and amongst them was this intriguing young man named Darren Curtis. Darren was an accounting major just like Latrice, and though they started off as friends, things quickly heated up between them. Before long, they became inseparable to the point that Latrice wanted to introduce Darren to her family. This wasn't going to be easy. For most men, meeting the girlfriend's parents is a very nerve-wracking experience. But Darren had to worry about meeting Latrice's three older brothers, who all looked like pro football players, and her dad, who was a corrections officer. It couldn't get more terrifying than this. It turned out Darren had nothing to worry about. He won over Latrice's brothers in an instant and had her mom eating out of his palms. But Darren still hadn't crossed the hurdle. He still had to meet Sherman Jones. Darren was extremely nervous to meet the man, who was not only a retired corrections officer, but whose opinion mattered the most to Latrez. And Sherman was determined not to make things easy for the young man who'd stolen his little girl's heart. But no matter how hard Sherman tried to hate Darren, once he got to know him, he realized he had been wrong. Darren was a former National Guard soldier who was ambitious, committed, and respectful. Eventually, Darren won Sherman over as well. Things moved quickly for the couple after her family's approval. They moved in together, and though they were very young, Darren proposed on April 27, 2007, and Latrice said yes. They were married at a chapel in Wake County shortly after. Latrice was excited to begin her life with Darren. She was doing great in school and had the man of her dreams beside her. The future looked very bright for Latrez, and it looked like nothing could go wrong. But unfortunately for her, something was about to go horribly wrong. Latrez and Darren were very much in love with each other and wanted to spend every waking moment together. But they were also very ambitious people with big dreams who wanted to excel in school. So they spent much of their time with their noses in books and between school and their jobs. Jobs, they hardly had time to spend together. And the less time they spent together, the less connected they became with each other. And soon enough, the cracks started to show. The once happy couple was no longer happy together. At least that's what the neighbors saw. And when the authorities came knocking on January 30th, 2008, that's what the neighbors told them. But the investigation into Latrice's death would turn up much more than an unhappy marriage. It would turn up details that would send chills down everyone's bones. They can see that she has been repeatedly about her face and throat. It's apparent that she has been murdered. On the morning of January 30th, 2008, Darren Curtis got ready for work. Latrice had called him the night before around 10 p.m. and told him she would be studying late and wouldn't come home till around midnight. Latrice had been doing a lot of late nights lately, and Darren wasn't happy about it, but there was nothing he could do. School was very important to both of them, and he couldn't stop her from prioritizing it. All he could do was wait up for her to make sure she got home okay before going to bed. But on the night of the 29th, Darren was very tired. It had been a long day, and he was exhausted. He went straight to the shower when he got home to wash away the stress of the day and had dinner after. By 11 p.m., Darren was up, waiting for Latrez, but while his mind was determined to wait up for his wife, his body was too tired, and before long, Darren was asleep. He didn't notice that his wife never came home. As he drove to work the next morning, he thought about it. He wasn't sure whether or not she had come home, and when he tried to call her, she didn't pick up. He was thinking about this as he drove by a group of law enforcement officers standing by the side of the interstate, surrounding what looked to be a crime scene. While he felt sad for whomever was involved, it was none of his business, so he drove on. He certainly had enough to worry about, but just a short distance from the crime scene, Darren saw a white car that looked a lot like his wife's car. He pulled over and went to the driver's side of the car, trying to look through the window, and that's when he saw a photo of the two of them in the car, and his heart sank. A very heavy feeling descended on him, wrapped tightly around his heart. He couldn't shake the feeling something awful had happened. The officers were very surprised to see a man claiming to be the possible husband to their victim, who just happened to be at their crime scene. He actually drove by out by the scene and saw his wife's car out there. I showed him the picture. I said, this is my wife. I said, it's her car up there. Is, is that, does that tell me that's not her under that tar? 
the officers took Darren to identify the body. Chills gripped Darren as he followed the officers to the body. The officers raised the tarp and Darren stood there frozen to the spot. The officers didn't have to ask him if that was his wife. They could tell by the way look on his face. Now that the police knew who their victim was, they needed to hear Darren's accounts of the events that led him to their crime scene that morning. Darren explained the events of the previous day to them. He told them he didn't know Latrice hadn't come home until 6.30 a.m. He said he tried to call her but got her voicemail. He had no choice but to get ready for work and hope for the best. He told officers he had called her father after noticing the car, but got a chilly response from him, so he hung up. The car he saw got him worried, so he called 911 to report his wife missing and then pulled over to look at the car. That's when the officers found him. The officers were naturally skeptical of Darren's story because it seemed like too much of a coincidence that he just happened upon his wife's car before they called him. It made more sense that he was just making sure he hadn't left something incriminating behind. Plus, how could a husband not realize his wife never came home and report her missing immediately. Darren explained to them that he had talked to his wife the night before and she told him she would be home late. It had been a pretty long day for him, so he fell asleep waiting for her. He also explained that it was normal for Latrice to leave the house before he was awake because they were both very busy people juggling work and school. The officers told him it was just too coincidental that he reported his wife missing, pretty much the same time the body was being discovered. Darren denied hurting his wife and told the police it was just a coincidence because he loved his wife. The officers let Darren go after realizing they had nothing to hold him with. He had been photographed, and there were no cuts and abrasions on his body. And from Latrice's body, it looked like she had fought for her life, so there was nothing physically tying Darren to the crime scene. The officers let Darren go. As the investigation progressed, the medical examiner informed the officers Latrice's autopsy was ready, and with Latrice's cause of death came a shocking discovery. When the autopsy was done on Latrice Curtis's body, there was a condom found. This condom found inside her during the autopsy tells law enforcement that she may have had intercourse recently. The first person they informed was Latrice's husband. Darren was shattered to hear what had been found in his wife's body. He and his wife never used protection, so it wasn't his. He agreed to come in to drop a DNA sample so the officers could rule him out. This discovery raised a lot of questions for the officers. If the protection wasn't Darren's, then who else had Latrice been sleeping? Sleeping with, and did it have anything to do with how she was viciously murdered? The officers decided to pull Latrice's phone records. They discovered Darren had been telling the truth. Latrice had called the night before at around the same time Darren said she had, but they discovered something else, something rather disturbing. A particular number caught the officers' eyes. There were several calls between Latrice and that number around the time of death. The officers were intrigued. Further investigation revealed that the number belonged to a man named Stephen Randolph. The officers immediately began looking into him, and what they unearthed sent the investigation on a very dark and twisted path. The officers began looking for a connection between Latrice and Stephen, and they discovered that he went to the same college as the couple. Not long after the officers made a connection between Stephen and Latrice, Stephen himself walked into the police station, but he wasn't alone. With him was a man he called his roommate, a local pastor named Robert Reeves. The officers separated Robert and Stephen and proceeded to interrogate them both. Stephen revealed that he and Latrez had a couple of classes together and had become fast friends, and she would sometimes come over to study at his place. When officers asked him if there was nothing more between them, Stephen denied it. The officers proceed to show him Latrez's phone records and her autopsy, and suddenly Stephen's story changed. He confessed to officers he and Latrez's relationship took on a different title as time went by and they began sleeping together. He told officers, the night she was murdered was only the second time she had come over to his place, and she left his house at around 10 p.m. And then Stephen revealed something that shocked the officers. He told officers that he had followed Latrez after she left his house, except he went a different way to his girlfriend's house. It was clear Stephen was not a faithful man, but could he be a killer too? Stephen then informed officers Latrez called him several times that night after he got to his girlfriend's house. She was worried about becoming pregnant, and she wanted to take their relationship to the next level. Stephen told officers that was all they talked about that night before he hung up, promising her they would talk more about it. They never did. Officers proceeded to talk to the pastor Stephen had come in with. Maybe they could get the truth from the man of God. Stephen Randolph had met Robert Reeves at a car wash where he worked part-time. Stephen had been having money problems and was desperate for a place to live. Robert Reeves was a well-known local minister who Stephen became quite close with, close enough that he could confide in the pastor about being homeless. The pastor saw Stephen as a good, hard-working kid who just needed help, so he offered a 
basement room in his house to Stephen for 300 a month. Stephen was beyond grateful. Having a place to live would ease his problems tremendously and allow him to focus on school and basketball. Stephen moved in. This would be the house where he would start an affair with Latrice Curtis. Officers found out that Stephen felt guilty after seeing news about Latrice's body being found on the interstate. He opened up to the good pastor about it, who advised him to go to the authorities and tell them what he knew. So that's how Pastor Robert Reeves came to be at the police station that afternoon. And when the officers asked him about Stephen, he didn't hesitate to tell them all he knew. He told them Stephen often brought girls to the house, and even though he didn't like it, Stephen was an adult who could do as he pleased. He told them he remembered seeing a white car parked outside the house that night after coming home from church, and he knew the car belonged to Latrez because he had seen her once before. He didn't know when Latrez left, but he did happen to see Stephen leave the house that night. At this point, officers had a picture of how Latrez spent her last hours, but they were still missing the final piece. They confirmed Stephen's alibi with his girlfriend, who, while shocked to find out her boyfriend was cheating on her, did confirm he had been with her until 1 a.m., but she offered something else, a troubling bit of information that would turn out to be key in solving the mystery of Latrice's death. The girlfriend revealed to officers she and Stephen had been getting threatening phone calls from a man with a blocked number. The caller always had one message, that Stephen needed to stop doing what he was doing or he'd break his legs and end his dreams of joining the NBA. She told officers she and Stephen had their tires slashed after being taunted on the phone by the man. These new details were interesting to the officers and turned them right back to Darren. If Latrice was ready to leave him for another man, it made sense he would taunt the man on the phone. And the calls were threatening Stephen to stop what he was doing. Those threatening phone calls might have been an attempt to stop his wife from having an affair. But they needed proof that it was Darren. So they obtained search warrants for his house and vehicle as well as Stephen's car in the basement. Both men gave officers everything they wanted, all the way down to DNA. The search on Darren Curtis's home and car came out clean as a whistle. But the same could not be said of Stephen's. The officers found something in Stephen's house. They found a minivan parked in the driveway of the house, and when they ran the plates, it came back as belonging to Pastor Robert Reeves, which was to be expected, as it was his property. But something truly alarming came back as well. The minivan had a citation on it from the night of the murder. It had been cited as an abandoned vehicle at 1.30 a.m. by a state trooper. Officers got in touch with the trooper who told them he'd seen the minivan on the side of Interstate 540 with its hazard lights on. When he went to check, he noticed the windows were down, even though it was raining. The key was still in the ignition, but there was no one in the vehicle. He ran the plates, which came back clean, but there was more. The trooper said he saw another white vehicle with its hazards on, but before he could check it out, he received an urgent call that took him away from the crime scene. Officers pinpointed the location of the minivan and the white car, and it was right where Latrice's his body was found. It was obvious that had the trooper not been called away that night, he might have walked in on the murder in progress. Officers brought Pastor Reeves in for questioning. At first, a look of terror crossed his face, but then he proceeded to tell officers that he had no idea how his car got there. He claimed that Stephen had access to his keys and had driven it for a while after his tires were slashed. The good pastor was not forthcoming, but a fingerprint found in Latrice's car told officers they had enough to formally make a charge. And on February 2nd, 2000, Pastor Robert Reeves was arrested. Prosecutors believe the suspect, Robert Reeves, was jealous of a relationship the victim was having. They believe that jealousy turned to rage, but you may be surprised to hear how detectives believe all this unfolded. The community was outraged to learn that the innocent pastor had been arrested in a case that seemed like it had nothing to do with him. But as the truth came out, they learned that the pastor they thought they knew was nothing less than a predator. Statements began in the case of Robert Reeves. He's accused of Latrice Curtis 40 times and then dumping her body on the side of I-540. During the trial, Robert's congregation and staunch supporters found out that the first time officers met Robert Reeves, they noticed he had fresh wounds on his arm, which he explained away as an injury from helping Stephen move a table. He made it seem like nothing, but officers found out there was more to the story. When they followed up with Robert's sister, she told them that she was there when Robert helped Stephen move the table, and she didn't remember him sustaining any injury. A background check on Robert revealed a long criminal history of preying on young boys at his churches. And if he got caught, he simply moved to a different area. There was more. When officers subpoenaed Robert's phone records, they found out he had three numbers registered to him. The calls on one of the numbers lined up perfectly with the time Stephen and his girlfriend received the threatening calls. They also found out that the DNA results from Latrice's car matched Robert's. But the most shocking revelations came when Stephen himself testified in court and told a story that left Robert's supporters completely astounded. He said that when he first 
first moved in with Robert thinking that he was a kind pastor who took pity on him. He soon found out Robert had a different thing in mind when he started making a pass at him. Though he rejected him several times, this didn't stop him. They say Reeves had made several advances to Randolph, but was rejected. He was so disturbed by this that he actually borrowed a gun from his cousin and kept it under his pillow in the basement. And he let Mr. Reeves know he was not interested. The court also heard that this was something that Robert would usually do. Prosecutors say Robert Reeves had a history of mentoring young men and then making advances at them. The final nail to the coffin came when Stephen explained to the court how the alarm system at Robert's house worked. He and Robert had different codes and when the officers checked the alarm records, they discovered Stephen's code disarmed the alarm at around 1.30 a.m. But at 2.30 a.m., someone disarmed it again with the master code. The prosecution then painted a picture of what happened the night after Latrezzi left Stephen's room. They say in this case, he came on to one man, he was rejected and then killed the man's girlfriend in a jealous rage. The court heard that Robert had been obsessed with Stephen, and on the night of January 29th, that obsession turned fatal. Pastor Robert, filled with anger that Stephen had rejected him while sleeping with a married woman, followed Latrice, and when she pulled over after she saw him following her, he proceeds to attack her and kill her. The jury had heard enough. They found him guilty, and he was given life in prison without the possibility of parole. Hey, thanks for watching. What are your thoughts on this case? Do you know of other similar cases? Let me know in a comment, and before you go, make sure you like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. See you next time, and stay safe.